This is Johnny with Tiger Bomb MMA, and tonight I'm going over UFC Fight Night Pavlovich versus Blades, giving you my thoughts and predictions on the entire card. Uh, really interesting main event. We've got power versus wrestling. We've got uh, black versus white. We've got uh, the U.S. versus Russia. It's tailor-made for everybody. It's like the perfect story. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the co-main event as well. I, I I love the co-main event because it it presents us a new threat to the bantamweight division as to who could potentially fight for the title or get that next step up in competition. I really want to see where Ricky Simone is at. I think I know where uh, Song Yadong is at. I'm totally questioning where we are at with Ricky Simone, so I'm interested in that. I just uh, just came back recently from Kansas City, the UFC Kansas City fight, the Arnold Allen versus Max Holloway. It exhausted the absolute SHIT out of me, so I'm kind of out of it. I'm, I'm a little hoarse. I was screaming the whole time there live. Like I screamed my guts out for Raw Dog when he knocked out that rat face fuck. And yeah, it, it was a great time. Like coming back at the drive back around like four o'clock is when I got back home. So if I sound kind of rough, it's because of that. But overall, great card. I actually got to meet one of the guys that made me the most money, which was uh, Daniel Zell Huber. Got to meet the guy. He's a nice enough fellow. Uh, but yeah, uh, overall good time for me, and I'm looking forward to going to more events, mainly because I made quite a bit of money that night. I made like 14 units. Just I don't want to necessarily say how I did it. I had to live bet a certain somebody that people thought lost. I don't want to get into that judging criteria of crap. But uh, yeah, overall good night for me. I got really lucky with that uh, with that uh, plus 700. But let's get started with the first fight of the night. We've got a prelim battle here, bantamweight. Dana Batgarel Storm versus Brady Bam Bam He Stand. And I am questioning the odds. I've got minus 175 for Dana come back on Brady plus 150. And I'm looking like I'm looking on Bovada. Cause when I saw the plus 150, I'm like, where it at? I don't see it. I see him like plus 110 realistically on Bovada. Uh, fight odds has him realistically at the plus 110. So I think I missed that plus 150. So with this particular breakdown, I kind of looked into both guys like the automatic thought that comes into my head is like Brady kind of has a shitty chin and Brady kind of sucks. And yeah, he's a good wrestler, but then I has got that power and doing more in depth research. I, I kind of think I got a good read on it, but I could be completely like, this is one of those matchups that like the better fighter might lose. And when they're not back row starts throwing punches, he throws heat. He throws a lot of, Raw, really solid right hands. And that's kind of what I think of him right now. Like, I think he did kind of get a bit exposed that that's really all he is. He's kind of a headhunter. He doesn't really do much more than try to knock you out. Doesn't really do much to the body. Decent enough kicks, but he does tend to, like, be Terminator mode, try to knock you out, follow you down, stalk you. And as of late, it's kind of it's kind of gotten tired. Like, we've seen his last two fights where uh, that loser, <laughs> Chris Gutierrez, I don't want to get into him, but... I, I thought he didn't get 30-27. I'll just say that. But with uh, the not back around Gutierrez, Gutierrez uh, had a good game plan around him. Like, don't get hit. Get out of the way. Hit him. And the not back girl was just kind of headhunting too much. Uh, kind of the same thing with Mr. Perfect. He tried to go too hard with the, the hard strikes, but Mr. Perfect was just landing that jab perfectly, and it did the most damage in that whole fight. Like, he busted up the not back girl. And with Brady, I know striking's underdeveloped, but he does hit – pretty hard for bantamweight he is going to be an inch taller an inch in reach advantage uh good jujitsu my issues with the kid is that although he hits hard his striking defense isn't there yet and on top of that his ground control isn't the greatest either there were some moments there with fernie obviously in the first round he got dropped fernie was also able to reverse him a few times on the ground it was like a little concerning for me but i kind of viewed brady a little differently after putting things in perspective, like he had a really close and tough fight with Ricky Tercios. He didn't look fantastic, but he looked like, hey, this guy's got definite skill. He's got skill on the ground. He can hit hard. I'm not discounting the guy just because he's 23 and he's made some mistakes in the UFC and in his first few fights. And uh, that Tercios fight kind of showed that he has the wherewithal, he has the drive, the motivation to push through even a grueling fight. 
and with Fernie, it also gave me the, the thought, like, maybe this guy doesn't completely suck. Maybe he just had a massive, uh, you know, test in his hands with Fernie and he passed it like he passed it with flying colors. He didn't necessarily like dominate, but he he showed heart. He showed motivation in there. And that determination, I think it really pushed him through to get this win, even if he gets hurt and meaning he doesn't he doesn't get knocked out. If he doesn't get knocked out, he'll probably win this one. But those consecutive takedowns he doesn't stop he's very relentless with those and i think that's what's going to get him the victory the plus 150 would have been great i see he started off like mine or plus 175 which would have been awesome I, I completely missed it i don't know if i'm going to touch him quite yet betting wise i'm going to pick him to win i think he can get a submission in the second round i, I think i think he's good enough on the feet to just not consistently threaten the takedown because if that happens meaning that option a b c and d is takedown then our back row is going to see that try to land an uppercut try to land the knee and if brady can stand with him for a little bit maybe land punches of his own like brady can crack he actually landed a really nice head kick on fernie rodriguez or fernie garcia i always call him fernie rodriguez for whatever reason uh but he landed a good head kick on him his chin is just a little concerning i'll say that but I'll go with Brady. I'm not uber confident in him. I just know that he has that back pocket wrestling that if he gets in any trouble, he'll go for it. And as long as he doesn't get knocked out, I do think he can win this fight. I think regardless of how good Dana Baccarol's takedown defense is, he's a strong guy, good hips. I still do think that Brady will get him down eventually, whether it be in round number two or three. He'll either get a finish along the way with a submission or just edge out that decision by 29, 28 at the very least. So I'll go with Brady by a second round submission. Next bout, we've got a flyweight battle. Priscilla Zombie Girl Cachuera versus Killer Kareen Silva. Silva is the favorite, minus 165. Come back on Zombie Girl, plus 135. Let me double check those odds. Let's see, Cachuera, she's right now around like a plus 160. And I know there's people out there that love betting Zombie Girl as a dog because she does what she needs to do. Like if you're not on her level to a certain extent, meaning that if, you, if you're too afraid to strike and you want to just spam takedowns and she's strong enough to pull you off of her, she's probably going to knock you out. Like she's good at at that she's good at absorbing punishment and moving forward she is a zombie girl for a reason the thing is she's moving down again to flyweight and she's fighting a what i think to be a pretty decent prospect at flyweight like she's pretty solid i have questions about her but we've got kareen silva here and what i have notes here about her is that uh she is from lisbon portugal oh wait no i'm sorry i'm so sorry she's actually a lesbian who prefers women from portugal my mistake but uh, when it comes to Kareen Silva, who's actually Brazilian, I think she's pretty solid. She is a, let me double check, a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Is she a black belt? No, no, no. She's a brown belt. I just, when I when I remember looking and remembering, I'm like, it was a really dark brown. But she's really active off of her back. The bitch will go for go-go platas, which you have to have a certain level of confidence on your back to go for those. And from what I've seen from her and looking at her record, because I'm like, her contender series fight wasn't uber impressive, although she got the win. She got the, I believe it was a rear naked choke, was it? No, guillotine choke. She got a guillotine choke real quick on that muscular Chinese woman, Jan. Uh, but Jan was kind of holding her down. I don't think Priscilla's going to be doing any of the sort. She's going to be trying to walk her down. Kareem Silva has decent striking, not the greatest, but I feel confident in her striking enough that she can get out of trouble and she can set up her takedowns properly. Like I mentioned in the previous fight, if you don't set up your takedowns properly, like a certain Billy Q did in a certain fight in Kansas city, it leads to that opening of like, there's a knee. And when there's a knee available, and now that people saw Edson Barboza kind of blast it, like I get a feeling people are going to try it a little bit more because it is a very effective tool that people don't often use or utilize when someone's taking a really bad shot and just throw up the knee. But with Kareem Silva, my questions about her are her gas tank. I know she's got, I wrote down here, 11 finishes and eight of them are in the first. She got a little gassy in the contender series fight, just a little bit. And she ended up getting the, uh, the submission, the guillotine choke. 
the thing is that she was trying to take down the muscular Chinese woman, but she wasn't able to, which kind of led to the gassing, which we've seen that before in the past with, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu girls that can't keep it striking. Their only option is to wrestle and go to the ground and they start pulling guard. And that's a bad look. Uh, zombie girls takedown defense isn't great. It's getting better, but I think she will get taken down and she will get submitted. I, I do have Kareem Silva to win. I do think she'll get a submission. Like I just like, I like the technique from her in her fight with uh, Poliana. That Darce choke was just excellent. I, I really went back and watched it. I'm like, everything was so tight. Everything was still snug. And the moment she let go, you saw Poliana just kind of be like, oh, damn. Like, she was still loopy. So I like Kareen Silva. Just don't get knocked out. And I think she wins this one pretty easily. Like, I think she'll make Cachoeira look kind of really worse than what we've seen her. Like, she's on a two-fight winning streak. But I, th I think reality is going to sit in here and Kareen Silva is going to, you know, take her back to school and take her to the mat and submit her. So I'll take... Kareen Silva by a second round submission. I think the first round might be kind of close because Priscilla, as I keep mentioning, she is training her takedown defense. She's training at MMA Masters. Colby Covington's there. I don't know if Colby messes around with the Brazilian chicks like uh, Priscilla, but uh, he, she's probably learning from him, like from afar. Like he's uh, throwing a combo and then she starts mimicking the combo. Like I want to be just like a Colby. So I'll go again. Kareen Silva round number two. Uh, next bout, I've got some opinions on this one. Francis the Fire Marshal versus William Jaguar Gomez. And we have two young guys, 24 for Marshall, 25 for Gomez. The odds are a little stacked, in my opinion, on Francis Marshall, minus 195 comeback on Gomez, plus 160. And let me double check, cross-reference here. Okay, Gomis is plus 170 now, and Marshall's like minus 110 based off of Bovada. So automatically, I do think Francis Marshall is like, no, like he's, he's overpriced. Like he's still very unproven. He's still, I don't want to say he's unskilled, but he's still like not mature enough yet for my eyes to be taking him at like minus 200. William Gomis, I don't think he's all that great. I don't think he's very good. I think he is more athletic. I think he's more, uh, what, what would you say it, uh, talented. And I think he's got some good techniques overall. It's just that I don't think he's very skilled. And that's a, it's a little weird for me to say, and I know, but he's 11 and 2. And what I mean is that I don't think he's very skilled, is that I think he gets by on like pure strength and pure athleticism, which is that can take you a long way, right? It'll take you, depending on the division, potentially to a title shot. But there's going to be that moment where he's going to get exposed where his techniques are going to just either get him tired or I'm sorry, his his raw strength, like in, opposed to his techniques, like if he's going for a takedown, for example, he's going to not do it the proper way where it's like least resistance. He's going to like slam the dude and use all of his strength opposed to like fire marshal over here that he's a more technically skilled guy. It's just that I just don't particularly think he is minus 200 quite yet. I, I do think he wins this fight. I think he's the better fighter, not necessarily on the feet. I think on the feet, it's going to be a little tricky because Gomez, like I mentioned, he is very athletic. He's going to have the reach advantage and the height advantage. He's going to be the longer guy. And I think he can have some good moments here against Francis Marshall. Francis Marshall, I'm starting to become more of a, a believer in the in the prospect. Not quite yet in the sense of like, I'm going to back him immediately for every fight. I do think he's got a solid chance to lose this one against Gomez, who, despite him looking awful in his last fight where he got rocked and he nearly got submitted and it just wasn't the type of performance you need to see from a guy making his UFC debut to solidify like, hey, this guy's an up and comer. And I felt a little bit differently when it came to Francis Marshall, like he fought uh marcelo rojo and i'm i'm a big fan of rojo and i thought rojo was gonna actually catch him because i didn't think his striking defense was all that great when it came to a francis marshall and i was looking pretty solid there because he was cracking him quite often but marshall did something in that fight that made me wonder like maybe this guy for 24 years old is going to be somebody in the near future he gave me a drew dober type of vibe where he was just getting cracked a bit but he just looked at Rojo like, really? Like, you think you're going to knock me out? He had this demeanor to him that was like, uh, this guy is very confident in his skill set. I, I think with some more time, he's going to be 
he would be a really good guy to watch in in featherweight. And the way he knocked him out, like he didn't even hit him that hard, but he finished him quite well. Like this guy's got some talent to him. I think if this becomes a fight of technique, it's going to go to Francis Marshall. The first round's going to be a little hectic in my eyes. I think it's it's got a good chance to drop the line on Marshall potentially to like definitely below minus 200, maybe maybe like minus 130. I think Gomez will have a decent first round because he again, he's got to have that height, that reach and that athleticism, but as the fight progresses, it's not going to be as evident that that athleticism is going to carry him to a win. It potentially could. I just don't have that uber confidence in in either guy. Uh, I'm going to pick Francis Marshall. I, I do think that he might have a good live betting possibility here, but I'll take him by decision. I think it's going to be a good test of both of these guys. I do think that if William Gomez comes out here and he definitely like saw his last fight and he's like, hey, I need to get cleaner on certain things, training at uh, factory MMA. He could have a really good fight and he can probably surprise a lot of people. I, I just want no part in it when it comes to like the, the betting aspect, unless again, I see some stuff live and that fi- uh, Francis Marshall line drops, but I'll stay away from it. I just think both these guys might like, I, I see potential in both of them more so Francis right now, but if Gomez can really go to a better gym, let me say that I do think he can get the proper training that he needs to, potentially be somebody special in this division because he's a, he's a tall guy at featherweight and, you know, eventually he's going to age out of the, the the division and move back up to, or move up to, to lightweight. I, I just want to see that progression and skill before I like start following the guy right now. He's just that French guy that kind of pulled the stunt to me, but Francis Marshall to me right now, the guy who kind of looked terrifying in his last fight based off of him getting hit and just being like, let's fucking go. I'm like, all right, cool. So Francis Marshall decision. Uh, Next bout, we've got at heavyweight, Muhammad Usman versus Junior Taffa. Junior Taffa, the brother of Justin Taffa. He's a former kickboxer. He transitioned to MMA, he's 4-0. And he is a pretty big favorite, too big of a favorite, minus 190. Come back on Usman, allegedly plus 155. But when I look at it, and this is what prompted me to kind of go back and forth with with the odds. The... Usman line is basically a pick of minus 110, minus 114 on Bovada. So I missed the line on Usman. And I'm going to go with Usman. I'm going to go with him by decision. You know, the reason I'm kind of cutting this short, I don't see really anything from Junior Taffa that poses a huge threat. I don't think he's got huge power. I don't think he's all that great of a kickboxer. He's he's good enough, I guess, to get into the UFC based off of who your brother is. But even his brother's not all that great. So I'm like... What are we seeing in Junior Taffa? He's, from what I gather, he's still kind of a skinnier heavyweight. Like he's he's listed. I don't even have his weight, but he looks kind of thin for heavyweight. Muhammad Usman, like he's he's two thirty ish, two forty, but he's built. He's strong, and you know he's got his brother behind him as well. They call him the motor because he's usually known to have good cardio for heavyweight, and he he does like not the best cardio period, but like for heavyweight standards where he can throw output and avoid punches i think he's solid enough here to win this fight like usman i'm not a big fan of i don't think he's all that great but i think in this spot especially at dog odds i think he's actually going to school junior top i think he's smart enough to avoid anything big and granted i have seen usman fight live and he's fought a polynesian guy and that polynesian guy fucked him up but he was a big fella he's a big dude oh justin sales something like that brandon sales brandon sales in the pfl i remember just being like like beat him up, beat him up sales. And he did it. Like he, he wrecked him. Like, I think he, did he finish him? Yeah. He submitted him with rear naked choke. Uh, that's not, a, that's a different, different story here. Like Usman's, I think going to be the better wrestler. He's going to be not quite the better striker, but he's going to have the better output. I think he wins this one by decision, possibly finds a finish along the way. If junior comes out here and knocks him out, you know, it's a win-win for me. Cause like, I don't particularly like Muhammad Usman. I, I really thought, uh, his last opponent, Zach Paunga, was going to win the Ultimate Fighter, and he kind of found like that meme left hook or so and knocked him out. It is what it is, right? Like I, I just never really been a fan of Usman. I thought he lost a couple fights in the uh, Tough House. I, one in particular, I'm like, how did he win that? Like because of his brother, more than likely. So it's a win-win for me, regardless of what happens. I might put some money on Usman if he becomes a dog again. 
overall, I'm not interested in this one. I just more am curious to see how Joe Junior Tafa looks in his UFC debut because, uh, you know, his brother kind of shat the bed one time, and I wonder if he'll do it the same because he's a big favorite, and I just don't oh, list it as a big favorite. I just don't think that's justified. But let's move on to the next bout at featherweight: Carol Rosa versus Norma Dumont, the Immortal, and listed currently minus one fifty four. Rosa come back on Dumont is plus one fifteen. Cross reference that it is a pick 'em now with Dumont being the favorite minus one fifteen for Dumont on Bobada. I keep missing these lines and it's bothering me that tip topology is kind of screwing me. But when it comes to this bout, I, I did my research on it. I went back, I watched it. I watched tape on Rosa. I watched tape on Dumont and it's going to be a close fight, but I think Dumont is going to edge it out. I think jokingly wise, she's the bigger girl. She's got a fat ass. Carol Rosa is not going to be able to take her down. Also featherweight is um, Norma Dumont's division. It's not uh, pe uh, not Pena's division. It's not uh, that that lioness's division whose name escapes me at this moment because again she's not relevant at featherweight. It's Norma Dumont's division because the UFC knows when Norma Dumont fights at bantamweight, it's not the same as when she fights at featherweight because that booty is just bouncier at featherweight, and I love it. I think she's just going to output Carol Rosa. She's going to have the better output. To an extent, Carol Rosa is known for having the better output in bantamweight. Moving up, I'm not sure how she's going to look. Like, she's not fought at featherweight. I don't think ever. Let me go check. I don't think she's ever fought at featherweight. Maybe, like, in regional regional fights. But from what I gather, I don't think she has fought at featherweight. Uh, she has in the past. I don't know why she's moving up. Like, maybe it's, like, a fast track to the title to fight Amanda. There, that, That's her, Amanda Nunes. Um, her last fight, Carol Rosa, that is, she kind of got a little, I don't know, she she kind of showed me that she's not the girl to really follow. Like, yeah, she'll beat a certain level of competition, but when the competition gets a little bit tougher, like she kind of shows her stripes where she's not all that great on her back. She's not necessarily the brightest girl. She threw a, an illegal knee to um, Lin, Lin, Landsberg, and she also got dropped by Landsberg. Granted, it wasn't the nastiest, you know, shot that dropped her she dropped she got back up immediately it wasn't terrible but it was like come on man like i think norma can have the the slightly better striking in this matchup but i mean is like maybe carol's gonna have the better volume but norma dumont's punches will have the bigger impact and i think that's gonna really edge out these rounds i think it'll might it might be a stalemate it'll go to a decision it'll be a striking battle i think norma dumont's just gonna hit harder and it's gonna sway the judges to pick her um, I just think Norma's going to be too tough for Carol Rosa at this weight class. Like, I've become a slight fan of Norma Dumont over the years because not only is she pretty and she's got a big booty, but she's got something to her. Like, she's got some skills. Like, she still needs to develop herself. And she's 32. Hmm. I don't know if she's going to develop anymore, but I think she's got enough in the tank to beat Carol Rosa. Uh, it just kind of sucks that I missed the line, but I'll go Dumont decision. Next bout, Ronnie Yaya versus Montel Jackson. And this one's an interesting bout because, um, as you can see, it's Montel Jackson round number one knockout. The odds themselves, minus two, I'm sorry, minus 625, come back on Yaya plus three. Wow, uh, these odds have been screwing me. Plus 430. Let me check again here. Okay, yeah, it's pretty accurate on Bovada. It hasn't changed. Montel Jackson should knock out Ronnie Yaya. Ronnie Yaya, not to say that he can't win this fight. And what I'll explain is that I do think Montel Jackson wins this fight nine out of ten times. That one time is when Montel Jackson gets too lazy in the cage. And I've seen him do it a few times where he just doesn't do enough. And the other guy either continuously takes him down the fight in question is the fight with, damn, what was his name? Brett Johns. Brett Johns was able to kind of take him down relentlessly. And I'm like, really, dude? Like, you're the bigger dude. You're going to have the longer reach. And you're going to let this guy do you like that? Since then, he's gotten better at, like, stuffing takedowns. But I'll give you an example of, like, the Montel Jackson kind of being lazy. He should have finished JP Buys. He went to a decision with him. And that's what scares me about this matchup. Montel Jackson should knock out Ronnie Yaya. The odds themselves are terrible. You can't just bet Montel Jackson unless you parlay him up 
But if you take him by knockout and he hurts Ronnie Yaya and he doesn't finish him because he he pulls a Yaya pulls a you know recover off my back booty scoot stuff and then he gets back up like is Montel Jackson going to follow up with punches or is he going to let him back up and then leads to a decision that's really the biggest biggest factor about this matchup that I'm the most worried about like Montel kind of gets a little lackadaisical a little lazy doesn't do what he needs to do a Montel Jackson who's on point who is there to kill he's going to finish Ronnie Yaya in like under under a round under half a round because Ronnie's been dropped. Ronnie's 38. Oh, I keep calling him Ronnie. It's Hani. But Hani is a tough old man. He's got that jujitsu. The way he handled Mr. Perfect. They always forget how to pronounce it. Kyung Ho Kang was kind of impressive. But Kang was piecing him up with the jab. Piecing him up with on the feet. And Ronnie kind of showed that he still got it a little bit. And that's what I am worried about Montel Jackson. Like If he comes out here and he's not looking for the kill... It could get him in trouble. Like if he drops Ronnie, finish him. Don't let him back up. So I will probably take him by knockout, but I'm not going to like complain and bitch if Montel doesn't follow up or doesn't finish him. I might take him round number one as well. But again, I have to be aware that he might do that shit. He might pull that like, it's okay. I, I, I'd rather just get my win bonus. I doesn't. I don't need to like knock anyone out. Like, I don't know what it is about Montel sometimes, but he should win this one. The odds themselves, uh, don't parlay him unless you're, comfortable losing i'll just say that like it's not worth it to me but i got montel round number one next bout lightweight ricky the gladiator glenn versus crystals the spartan yagos and this is fantastic we got the gladiator versus the spartan minus 110 for ricky glenn come back on yagos plus 170 i'll keep this one relatively short because i think uh, they match up decently well uh, ricky glenn being that big of a favorite was a bit concerning i'm like why and i watched some tape and i'm like okay i get it uh, the whole aspect of this fight comes down to Christos Giagos just kind of being a <sighs> Christos Giagos is a good fighter. He's got good, good striking, good power, good wrestling, good submissions, decent enough cardio when he's fighting a certain level of competition. For example, let's take a look. He's fighting Sean Soriano's. He's fighting the Carlton minuses. He beat the crap out of Carlton minus. And let me, let me just give you this example of how good Christos Giagos is when he's fighting these lower guys. Carlton Minus did not belong in the UFC. Carlton Minus had a fight lined up with somebody, and Carlton Minus' opponents pulled out. Christos Giagos took the fight like on super short notice, and Christos Giagos was like a minus 320 favorite, if I remember correctly, on short notice. And I'm like, yes, exactly. That, that's how he should treat these guys. That's how we should view him at these moments. When it comes to like that tougher competition and i do mean tougher when it comes to ricky glenn because he's a tough he's a tough bastard but uh the sean soriano fight going back and rewatching it put everything in perspective to me like so soriano's a round one fighter he's good for a round and then he just falls off a cliff like he's like mentally programmed to be like hey your alarm clock is five minutes go out there get the finish and if you don't get the finish i want you to explode and he does that and that's what happened like christos got rocked by that 45er and i think ricky glenn does the same ricky glenn he's been away with a torn groin and that's a little like hey you've been on the shelf for a little bit but i still think he's got every bit of toughness even with the torn groin or not i think even if giagos has a good first and second round ricky glenn comes out in the third and finishes him i think glenn's boxing's better he's going to have the not the reach advantage but i think his chin's going to be better and i think exchanging jabs Giagos isn't going to like it. Giagos might shoot for a takedown. They're going to get stuffed. He'll get tired, and Ricky Glenn's going to whip his ass. Ricky Glenn's whipped a lot of asses in his day. Uh, what was it? The This guy. No, no, no. What was his name? Um, we haven't seen him since Ricky Glenn. No, no, no. Danny Gay knocked him out. Uh, uh, Gavin Tucker. If if you're new to the sport, go back and rewatch Gavin Tucker versus Ricky Glenn if you want to see an absolute ass whooping. And to an extent... Uh, that chin of Gavin Tucker's never been the same again. So I'll go with Ricky Glenn. I'll say second round knockout because Giagos is good for that first round as well. And I think after a couple shots to the body, Ricky Glenn is going to crumble him. So I'll go Ricky Glenn, round number two knockout. Next bout, Jeremiah Wells versus Matthew Semmelsberger. This is the main card opener. And yeah, Jeremiah Wells, minus 140, Matthew Semmelsberger, plus 115. 
And let's double check those odds. Yep, minus 150. Actually, they've they've gotten a little closer. Minus 115, minus 105. So the lines have gotten better for Jeremiah Wells. And I think on paper, it makes more sense. I on paper, on paper, it makes sense that it's close, but I don't know. I don't know the credentials. Like if, if if we're just basing this off of performances, yeah, it's close. But credential wise, I think it's not really that close. I think Jeremiah Wells should be around like minus one sixty, and I could be wrong uh, because there's a certain factor when I mentioned like the other performances compared to the like, like on paper. Jeremiah Wells, <laughs> he's a ridiculous man. He's absolutely powerful. He's got that weird like African. Drickus Duplissi's power where it's like he bonks you and then you're like on the ground asking like what year is it like he didn't hit me that hard like it wasn't that hard of a hit well, why am I uh why am I hallucinating while I'm awake I don't know when it comes to Matthew Semmelsberger I think he has that same kind of power he hits really hard but not the same level of power Jeremiah Wells uh, Semmelsberger looked pretty decent via my memory when he fought uh, Jake Matthews when I say via memory, I remember because I had uh, just a single parlay with uh, Matthews in it. And I kind of felt like, yeah, I think Semmelsberger might do well here and could crash the parlay. But let's see. I, I think if round number one goes the way of Matthew Semmelsberger, I think down the line, Matthews will take over. And what I remember is that Matthew Semmelsberger cracked him in the first and cracked him in the second. And then the third round, he kind of like got a little tired. But I'm like, okay, Matthews looked... Uh, pretty bad that night he did Matthews looked really bad he fought really dumb he didn't shoot for takedowns he didn't mix things up he tried to strike he tried to counter with Matthew Semmelsberger who had the better faster strike it was the counter left hook versus the like overhand right the overhand right won every time and I think Matthew looked good in that fight because of how bad um Jake Matthews looked and Jake Matthews' side IQ went out the window until the third round because he was winning that second round and he could have won that second round. There was like maybe a minute left and he decides to not like solidify the round by going for a takedown or just kind of guaranteeing him that round to win. And he just kind of let Zemmelsberger walk him down. And he cracked him again, dropped him, and he lost that round. Like it erased everything good that Matthews did in that round and it went all the way of Matthew Semmelsberger. But that whole round was... Jake Matthews is just that Matthew landed that punch and it just, again, erased all the good stuff that Jake Matthews did. And when it comes to this matchup, I think Jeremiah Wells has the ability to potentially knock out Matthew Semmelsberger on his way to going for like a, a takedown. Like he, he bum rushes. And that's what I don't like about Jeremiah Wells. Like that's where I think he can get in trouble. That's why I think the odds themselves are closer because he does expose himself and he does throw terrible punches, but they land like again, tricky stupid close your eyes, swing and then knock him out. And I, I think Jeremiah Wells on the ground, black belt and jujitsu powerful man. He's going to be the shorter guy, which will lend him to just shoot under much quicker when it comes to like the six foot one Semmelsberger and the five, nine Jeremiah Wells. I think Jeremiah Wells is just going to be too threatening in that cage. Sam, I might try to meet him with force. Sam, I can connect. He can knock him out. But if he doesn't, I do think Jeremiah Wells completely takes over and gets him to the ground. Like Semmelsberger's takedown defense wasn't all that great. We saw how uh, A.J. Fletcher was able to take him down as a shorter guy as well. He's also a powerful black man himself, A.J. Fletcher. You could call him the ghost because he's an albino. But uh, with with Matthew, I think we've seen him lose this fight before against a much smaller guy, at, a, at like a lightweight essentially. And now he's fighting a massive welterweight that's going to be able to take him down and kind of do what he wants to him on, on the way. So Jeremiah Wells, to me, I think I'm going to take him now that the odds are better. Um, if he gets to be a dog, I'm going to spam him. But I just have to be aware, and I think most people have to be aware, that the looming possible knockout from Matthew Semmelsberger might come because Jeremiah Wells is a little like, you know, let's let's swang and bang. You know what I mean? I just don't like the way he throws his punches, but they are super effective. Like when he knocked out Court McGee, I was like, oh shit like um how and then they replay it and it's just like his arms are so long that it just the way he threw his weird punches like he threw a jab a right hand and he kind of just swang his uh left hand to throw the hook and it just connected with the tip of the knuckles and i'm like whoa okay this guy's uh powerful like he's getting up in age but i think he's still got it i think uh 
think his time is going to come soon. But right now against Semmelsberger, I think he's going to beat him. Uh, I think he can finish him in. See, that's one's tough. I, I do think Jeremiah Wells wins. I just don't know how because of that weird knockout power. Like, I fully believe he's going to try to, like, rush in, throw a jab and an overhand right, and then duck under for a takedown. By, but at that time, like, Samuelsberger's lifeless body's limp, and he takes him down. He's like, what happened? As he's going for, like, a ground and pound, you know? Jeremiah Wells is, like, trying to fight off the, the referee because he's like, what's going on? Like, oh, he's out. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so I think Semmelsberger's chin is good enough. He's he's eaten some shots from Chaos Williams, so we'll see. But I'll, I'll go second round submission for Jeremiah Wells. Next bout, Yasmin Lucindo versus Brogan the Bear Walker. Minus 300 for Lucindo. Comeback on Walker is a plus 230. I did a little bit too much research when it comes to the Brogan Walker side because automatically I'm like, yeah, Lucindo should win this one based off of her last performance alone like she's fought some good competition herself not as not as good as competition as Brogan Walker and I'll get to that but Lucindo is just shown more she's shown just more period and I don't know how much more to explain like she's shown a better chin she's shown better aggressiveness better striking I don't know how good her takedown defense is Lucindo because she's usually the one going for takedowns and ground and pound uh, she's also if I wrote this down I believe a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and I wrote down a little quip here that like, because she just got her purple belt, just like a new pair of Jordans, she's going to want to show those bitches off. She's going to want to show off that ground game. I just think that at 21 years old, Yasmin Lucindo's too good for her age. Like she's just too damn good. Like sky's the limit for this young lady. And on top of that, she's got those DSLs. So I like this girl a lot. And I do think she's going to win. I think she's going to potentially decision Brogan Walker. But what was worrisome to me is that a lot of people were like, yeah, I think this is the the play. Like she's a parlay piece of the week. Brogan Walker's not all that great. I don't I don't agree with that completely. I think Brogan Walker is is a solid fighter. She's fought some good competition. Like I'm going back and watching her fights in uh, Invicta against a 21 year old Miranda Maverick. And I'm like, how did she beat Maverick? So I'm watching the fight and the common theme of kind of this this card for me at least is people who don't set up their takedowns properly and if your takedowns and your grappling is your only option girls and guys like brogan walker or for example like edson barboza in his last fight they're going to take advantage of that and that's kind of what happened like uh, miranda maverick she only had that one option and Brogan was able to like stuff the takedowns even reverse her at times because like when you're exhausting yourself going for these takedowns that you can't get you know, certain girls with more experience are going to beat your ass. And I was like, maybe she'll do the same thing here with this another 21-year-old than Lucindo. I don't think that's the case. A couple fights that kind of like solidified, like, yeah, she's going to lose this fight, were the fights with Pearl Gonzalez, where Pearl just consistently took her down. But she, she was able to box her up as well. But she was just, fuck it, I'll take you down. I'll beat you up on the ground. And also the Aaron Blanchfield fight. Aaron Blanchfield, and again, she fought Miranda Maverick and Aaron Blanchfield. Those are much better competition than Lucendo's fought. Uh, Lucendo, Lucendo, that is, uh, just fought Howdegi, and Howdegi's a good prospect, but they're not in the level of these two ladies. But um, Aaron Blanchfield wasn't able to finish her. Aaron Blanchfield kind of showed a good game plan of pressure, 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 beat her up on the feet because, like, when you pressure Brogan, she doesn't really like it too much. Even Juliana Miller showed that. She doesn't like the pressure. And then, you know, work your takedowns from there. Lucindo's gonna do that if she can't get the takedown. It's be like Plan B, slang leather, which she she can crack and she's got a good chin. And I just think that Lucindo's gonna win this one. I, I think Brogan's tough enough to survive. I think she she's proven that in the past. Like Juliana Miller beat her, but that's like a very lanky, awkward girl. It just it just worked out that way for it. But I, I do think Lucindo, being a smaller girl, I, I think she decisions her. If she gets a submission along the way, I'd be ecstatic because i want to see her progression on the mat but i think she's just a much better fighter because she has too many options she's got more options than brogan walker has so i'll go with lucindo by a decision next bout bobby king green versus jared flash gordon and we've got the odds minus 280 for bobby green plus 225 for jared gordon and i'm like can jor can gordon get the upset here it's a possibility just based off of where Bobby Green is at. I've been hearing talks about retirement and it's talked about retirement before. 
And the thing is that his last performance with uh, that Aryan bastard, Drew Dober, was one of the best performances from Bobby Green I've ever seen in my life. Like He looked exquisite for that first round and a half. Excellent head movement. The jab was on point. Punches were landing like lasers. Takedown defense was good. And he ended up getting caught. And, you know, he got knocked out, which kind of sucks because I had the over two and a half. And it uh, Drew Dober, uh, Drew Dober fucked me. But it is what it is, you know, shit happens like that. I didn't expect Bobby Green to get knocked out. I thought, I thought his head movement was going to be too good, his defense. But he got a little, I don't want to say lazy. I, th I think he just got a little too comfortable against the cage. He had nowhere else to go. And then he got cracked by very opportunistic Drew Dober with that ridiculous left hand. Jared Gordon obviously had that really close fight with Patty Pimblett, which a lot of people say that he that he won. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that neither guy really won that fight. Neither guy solidified it. So fuck it. I don't care. If you lose, you lose. You know what I mean? Like if you don't solidify the rounds, don't be bitching if you, uh, you lose a decision that you thought you won because you did a little bit more of holding on. But... Yeah, with Jared Gordon, he's a tough guy. He He's definitely a, a guy capable of overachieving. I just think that if Bobby Green shows up here, the same Bobby Green, or even like a fraction of the Bobby Green that showed up with a Drew Dober, uh, Jared Gordon's going to get knocked out. He's been knocked out before. I I just think Gordon's a good guy to bet as a dog when it comes to matchups that he's not, he's not completely out of his realm in a certain part. Like the striking, I think Bobby Green's just too good. Gordon, he's he's gotten better. He's he's gotten better and he can beat up some guys that don't have the same level of like high level striking. Like for example, put Jared Gordon in there with uh Rafael Faziv or Rafael Faziv, like are you gonna say, Oh, his his ground games we've seen it's not all that great. He got taken down by Gagey, so he's got a chance. No, he's gonna get knocked the fuck out. Bobby Green, you know, he's been taken down in the past, but his his grappling's getting a lot better. I just think that it's just more of a concern of the odds and the mindset for Bobby Green. I don't think the knockout really affected him all that much. I think it's more of like, oh, damn, he got me, you know? And that's kind of what I saw. Like, he he got hit. He went out for a little bit. He got right back up. He's like, are you serious, man? And he goes up to Drew Dober and he hugs him. And it was like, oh, you got me, bro. You got me. And it, it, I think that's what's going to happen here. I think Bobby Green is going to come out here more motivated. I've been seeing him buying jewelry. I think he wants that. Not only the, the win bonus, the show bonus, but he wants the 50G bonus. So you got to buy a couple good chains for the man. I'll go Bobby Green round number two knockout. I think Jared Gordon's going to like definitely try to go for those takedowns. He might get a couple. I think Bobby Green sprawls out and he does his thing. At the very least, I think he pieces him up to a decision, but I think he gets a knockout along the way. So I'll go Bobby Green round number two knockout. I just, I don't know. I, I'm not too comfortable betting him. I don't think he's like quite the parlay piece that most people might think. Uh, moving on, we've got middleweight bout. We've got Brad Tavares versus Bruno Blandado Silva. The odds have it minus 155. Tavares, Bruno Silva plus 130. And let's see. Yeah, Bruno now is like a plus 145. Tavares is minus 175 based off of Bovada. And uh, I understand it. I just think there's quite a bit of value on Bruno Silva. His last fight obviously left a lot of sour tastes in people's mouths because he was supposed to go in there and knock out Gerald Mearshart, but he never did it. He looked really bad. He looked like the complete shell of himself. I have this recurring joke that Bruno Silva's soul is off of his body. It's like floating out in ether, and he's trying to find its way back to Bruno Silva since that left hook that Pereira landed on him, just like his soul just went immediately out of his body. So he's been the walking corpse of the last like fight. So this fight, I, I find it to be interesting because Brad Tavares doesn't necessarily have the, the biggest power. I, I think it's going to be kind of a, a back-and-forth striking battle with whoever has the harder strikes is going to probably win on the judges' scorecards. I think Bruno Silva has, I think, the better power between the two. He's got more knockouts. He hits ridiculously hard. He's what they call like a black belt in Muay Thai. And I think he's also a black belt in Jiu-Jitsu. But I don't think it's going to matter. Brad Tavares' takedown defense is ridiculous. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. That's, that's his best quality, in my opinion, is his his takedown defense, and then he punishes you when, you know, you you fail on those takedowns. I just don't fully think that Bruno Silva's this washed-up guy quite yet. The the fight in San Diego, there was humidity talks. I think he mentioned that he was sick. 
I just don't see a world where Brad Tavares is like this ridiculously overpriced guy that beats up a guy like Bruno Silva, who I think has a little bit more to show. And, you know, I don't particularly think Bruno Silva is the guy that most people thought he was like going back and rewatching his career. I think there were some signs there that he was like, maybe, 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 maybe not like a, a top level dude. Uh, but what was funny is that he looked kind of like a top level dude against the former champion, Alex Pereira. He, he had some good showings in there. Like he ended up losing that fight, but he looked solid and we expected, Hey, if that runoff performance comes up against Gerald Mearshart, he's going to, going to knock him out. I think that runoff performance hasn't occurred yet. And it, it might come here. I think he, he needs to train harder. He needs to make sure he's not going to come in the fight night sick or not taking a guy on, not seriously like he more than likely did against Gerald Mearshart. And I think he wins this one by a decision. And the main factor is that when I went and watched the Brad Tavares fight and the Drakus Duplessis fight, I was like pretty high on Brad. I'm like, I think Brad finishes this guy because Drakus looks like shit in most of every fight. And he did in that first round. And I thought to myself, like, damn, Brad's looking great. Brad's going to win this fight. He's got one round in the bag. Then I rewatched it again, like fresh eyes. It was more that Drickus fought like an idiot. He fought like a, a horny teenager trying to bang his girlfriend. And he hasn't even taken his pants off yet. He's trying to like go start humping. And so like, chill out, like Drickus, what are you doing? And that's what cost him. Like he made too many dumb mistakes and Brad, was the beneficiary beneficiary of those. I don't think Brad really did anything too special. It's just more so that he he took the crumbs that were there left by Drickus. Like he Drickus did a lateral drop terribly and he, Brad landed on top of him and he took advantage of it. Come second and third round, it was like, okay, uh Drickus is just bum rushing him and hitting him and and Brad just didn't have anything. Like he didn't look all that great. And I think Bruno can do the same thing. He can just follow the steps of of the African King and drink his duplicies and throw punches, bust up the face of Tavares and he wins this fight. The striking numbers might be very close, but I think the, the power shots from Bruno might be the deciding factor at, at plus money. You know, why not? Like I already know people are going to shit on me if I take them and he ends up getting his ass beat and they'll be like, I told you so, but what if he doesn't, maybe I'm the smart one. I'll find out, but I'll go Silva by a decision. I think he's got a good chance here against Bruno or against uh, Brad Tavares. Co-main event, Song Yudong versus Ricky Simone. Odds minus 135 for Simone. Come back on Yudong plus 115. And that is pretty accurate. I think I see Bovada has it minus 140 for Ricky. And I've got a lot of opinions on this fight just because I think they're perfectly matched up right now. And their trajectories are a little all over the place, right? Ricky Simone, to me, I think he's going up. But where is his cap? And Song Yudong, I think he's at a certain spot now where he's getting more respect, but we see the obvious flaws in his game. And there's a little bit of a backstory between these two that most people may not talk about. Like, I didn't really know or remember it until like I did more research on it. Like, it's a little fact that I completely forgot about, but we've got Ricky Simone fighting another Team Alpha guy. And who is the king of Team Alpha male? Uriah Faber and Uriah Faber is the guy who completely derailed Ricky Simone back in the day. Ricky was supposed to go in there, beat up the 40 year old guy returning and he got cracked with an overhand, right? He got finished and it completely like changed Ricky Simone's trajectory at that time to like a guy who was like an up and coming dude. Like he might be a, a dangerous threat in the division to a guy who is kind of a laughing stock a bit. Like he's the guy who cost a bunch of people their money and that's kind of how it was for a little bit. And people really didn't forgive Ricky Simone because of that. And you go back and you watch his fight with Rob Font. Like he got pieced up. He couldn't get Rob Font down. He got pieced up. So he had that only option of going for that takedown. He beats Ray Borg, which was like, whatever. You beat a smaller guy. You beat uh, a nobody in Gaetano Perillo. You beat up Brian, Brian Kelleher. I'm like, yeah, these are matches you should be winning. Then he beats up Rafael Sunsau. And it's like, okay, yeah, you knocked out an old man, but... What did we see there? We saw that he was relentless with the takedowns and then he was able to knock him out. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a lot better. Like he's developing his striking. He's not afraid to strike because uh, I, I remember distinctly in that fight where his coaches were like, Hey, he's against cage. He's against cage. And then he unleashed punches on Rafael Sanz. I was like, Hey, that was like probably something that they drilled. Like, Hey, get him up against cage and then just blast him. 
It was great. Jack Shore fight. I I have some opinions on the Jack Shore fight where it, it may or may not translate into the Song Yudong fight, but he wasn't really able to get him down to the ground too easily. Like I think Jack Shore's takedown defense is underrated. I think him being a big dude at Bantamweight at the time was a reason why Jack Shore wasn't able or Ricky Simone wasn't able to really take him down. He eventually did slam him to the ground at one point, but I think Jack Shore's takedown defense is, is pretty top, top notch. It's just the bigger dude is difficult for Ricky. When it comes to Song Yudong, his takedown defense is clearly fantastic. His get-up game is great. I've heard people talk about the fight with Cody. Um, oh, my God. Cody Stamen. And he had some difficulties, Cody, that was holding him down. Come the third round, he did kind of hold him down a bit. And I, I don't think it's the, the quite the same fight. I think Cody Stamen isn't as big as Ricky Simone. And as of late, I feel as if Song Yudong's takedown defense, although great in his get-up game is great, I do know that Ricky Simone's going to take him down. He's going to take him down. The only way he doesn't get taken down is that if uh, Song Yudong knocks him out beforehand. And my opinions in Song, I feel as if he's a solid fighter, but his biggest, I guess two biggest attributes is that he is a brawl, a uh, stall and brawl. I'm sorry, sprawl and brawl kind of guy. He can get back up and start unleashing punches, but there's ways to beat the guy. I think the blueprints out there, like stay away from him, don't get hit by him, kind of go for the takedowns, just stop his momentum. And I think Ricky can do that. I think Ricky can stop the momentum as they're going forward. Like he keeps going forward, Song Yudong does, and he's trying to land that knockout. He's trying to land some significant punches. But if Ricky were to like, say, jab him, get out of the way, duck under, doesn't have to get the takedown, just picks him up a little bit, uh, song reverses, you know, gets his ass against the cage and it becomes a, a battle there against the cage. I think Ricky can continuously do that, kind of knock it. Song Yudong started with his strikes and he can edge out this decision. I think Ricky's definitely talented. I think he's progressing as a fighter. I think he doesn't need to just wrestle anymore. He can definitely strike. We saw how he knocked down uh, Jack Shaw. He cracked him really hard. And the way he took his took mount and choked him out was incredibly impressive. I think there's a lot of upside to um, song, I'm sorry, to Ricky Simone. I just, again, I don't know what his ceiling is going to be. I think he poses a lot of threats in that division where he can use that wrestling to get decisions or to make fights closer. I think Song Yudong, on the other hand, he just has that power. And I just don't know how well he's going to do in the in the top of the bantamweight division. I don't think he'll beat Aljo. I don't think he'll beat uh, Marab. Ricky Simone at least has the case to say, I've, I've choked out Marab Dravalishvili. So I just think there's more upside to Ricky right now. I think if if you compare the two, if you develop Ricky striking, I think he wins this fight. Not easily. He just has to watch out for anything ridiculous. Don't force any takedowns. Don't get flustered. And I think he wins this fight. I think he wins this one by decision. Uh, Song Yudong's tough to to really finish. And, you know, I, I like Song quite a bit. I just, I get this feeling that he's just not the guy. I, I just don't think he's the guy. I really don't think Ricky's the guy either. But I think he's got one more fight to prove to us that he's not the guy. I think in this one, he he definitely shows that he's he's in talking contention to be like, oh, let's see him fight Cheeto, which I would love. <laughs> you know, I think a, a five round fight with Cheeto and Song Yudong would be great because we get to hear some more anti Chinese shit from uh, from Cheeto. But I think a Ricky Simone versus Cheeto fight would be fantastic because we got it'll be a it'll be a brawl. So I'll go with Ricky Simone by decision. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll bet him quite yet because I, I do see the likelihood of him getting knocked out if he does anything too dumb. I don't think he will, but I that team alpha male curse kind of thing, like if he gets cracked by the student of the guy who knocked your your uh, your streak last time, I I don't want to hear that. Like, oh, the curse of team alpha male, Ricky Simone. Like, who's going to knock him out next? Uh, who's in team alpha male? Uh, who's that girl from team alpha male? Uh, Poppins is going to knock him out next. Who knows? But uh, let's go on to the main event. Sergey Pavlovich versus Curtis Blades at heavyweight. Minus 175 for Blades, plus 145 for Pavlovich. So it, it's pretty simple to me, honestly. If if Blades gets a takedown, he's going to win this fight. If he plays around too much, Sergey Pavlovich, that plus 145 is fantastic. If Curtis Blades decides to play around on the feet too much, I... I've noticed a certain trend from Blades where he 
tries to gauge his striking recently. Like he's fighting guys that are huge threats to his chin. And he's like, oh, let me let me keep it striking for a little bit. Rosen strike. Why are you not blasting doubles immediately? Like he tried to strike with him a little bit. He gets hurt. Like Mark Hunt, if you go way back in the day, tried to play with him on the feet, got hurt. Um, Dawkins, for example, he played around with him a little too much. He got hit a little bit, but in reality, Dawkins wasn't really much of a threat with the hands or the power. And then we saw what happened there where he cracked him, I believe with a, with a jab. And then he just finished him on the feet or on the ground. Tom Aspinall, you can't really count that because Aspinall got hurt. Pavlovich, on the other hand, we know what his lone loss is, which was a, a loss to Overeem, who was undersized. He tripped him, got him to the ground. Pavlovich had nothing there. Literally, he was like, oh boy, what do I do? And he got ground and pound by the guy who essentially taught or who was taught by Curtis Blades how to ground and pound. Curtis Blades and Alistair Overeem were training partners at one point in elevation. And I think at that time, it was like, oh shit, the ground and pound from, from Overeem is like, probably learned it from Curtis Blades. Pretty cool. And I think that's how this will happen. If, if Curtis Blades gets a blast double immediately, he takes down Pavlovich, he's going to pound him out. But that looming threat of that Blitzkrieg from Sergei Pavlovich is a, it's a huge, like it's, it's a huge possibility. Like the guy moves forward. He has good hands. The guys, I, I saw a video of him on Instagram doing shadow boxing. And I'm just like, maybe, maybe they are the master race after all. <laughs> Cause I was like, Jesus Christ. It was like, this guy's terrifying. And you know, as long as Curtis doesn't want to test his striking out with the Aryan Uber Minch, I think he can get the job done. It's just, I I have so many issues with blades. Like I feel as if he's not the smartest guy. Like, like I go back and yes, he got caught by, by Derek Lewis with that uppercut, but I didn't like how he just was trying to play on the feet too much. Like if he wanted to take him down, he could, he could have just kept it standing. He made the, he shot the worst shot and it was just like, you were just asking to get knocked out. And Curtis sometimes does that. Like he gets a little like in his own head and he makes a big mistake or he gets dropped and then he recovers. He shouldn't be doing that. Like part of me wants to take Pavlovich by, by knockout. The train's going by. So that just means someone's going to be running a train on the other. I think it, it's not going to go the distance. So for me, I I'd probably go with that prop on a parlay. I have to go with blades because realistically, like I've seen Pavlovich go three rounds, but that's mostly striking. I don't know how good his gas tank is going to be if it gets extended. Um, blades is a big boy and he should definitely come in here, get a takedown. Like his blast double is ridiculously good. It's just, I don't know how good his fight IQ is blades. That is like, again, he like, if, if you were on blades with Dacus, when he fought Dawkins and I, I was on Dawkins at that time because one of the worst takes I had, but I was on Dawkins and I'm like, yeah, he's probably going to strike with him. And he did. And imagine you were on the blade side and you had money on blades and you see him striking with Dawkins and you're like, when is he going for a takedown? He didn't go for a takedown, knocked him down, got on top and finished him. which yes, if he did that, it would have been more than likely, but I was banking on the fact that he would strike with Dawkins a little bit, which he did. Imagine if you are on blades money line, and he decides, I'm going to strike with Pavlovich. How ridiculously pissed would you be? And that's kind of like why I worry betting Blades or even picking Blades because it's it's a very 50-50 matchup, on the, not necessarily on the feet, but like when it starts 50-50 and then one of these people has to react. If they go at each other and they start striking, Blades has to duck under and get that takedown. If he doesn't get that takedown, I think he's in a world of shit. But I do think he gets the takedown eventually and he gets the finish. I think he he probably gets in like round number two. I think he is going to tire out Pavlovich against the cage a bit, clinch him up, which would be smart, right? Like he clinches him up, don't get hit, take him down, beat him up. Round number two, TKO for me for Blades. I uh, I don't know though. Pavlovich is uh, it would be better for the division honestly if Pavlovich wins because Blades, you know. I feel as if Pavlovich has that X factor where he can knock out a lot of dudes. He maybe shouldn't. And blades has the X factor of getting knocked out by dudes that he shouldn't be knocked out by. So I'll, I'll probably stay away from it. I might again, take the doesn't go the distance, but uh, yeah, I, I am very intrigued by how long this matchup is going to go. I might even do the under two and a half or maybe even under one and a half. We'll see. 
But those have been my predictions for Pavlovich versus Blades. Let me know what you think. Uh, make sure you hit the thing and then to uh, click the whatever. Uh, appreciate if you join the Discord. Should be a link below. Again, Johnny Tiger Bomb MMA. Uh, stay H A R D, which stands for in the betting world. Stay humble, attentive, respectful, and determined. So remember to stay hard. Catch you next fight.